Hey, John here. Let's look and see what happens if we take a risk five, 32i, an RV32i core or a heart, right? Let's call this one heart number zero. What is a heart? Remember, it has register, file, and it has a program counter. It has an ALU in here, all right, et cetera, right? It's the whole machine in one box here, and it connects over to memory, all right? So there's where the instructions, the data and stuff go on. What if we have another heart in there at the same time, right? Well, what does that thing look like? It's the same as the first one, right? It has its own ALU, it has its own registers, it has its own program counter, and it independently hooks up to the same memory with the first one. What if I have another one? Well, dot, 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 they're all the same. Spoiler alert. <laughs> all these other ones have an ALU, registers PC, hooks up to the memory. ALU, PC, registers, hooks up to the memory, and so on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, Okay. This memory, because every one of them is going to be hooked up to it together, is shared memory, okay? So this is shared memory. Okay? What other observation can we make? Each one of these has its own separate and unique and autonomous program counter and registers. Therefore, this heart, this core, can be executing instructions from a different place in this memory than this one is here, because they both have completely independent uh, program counters. So what does that really mean? What kind of a machine is this? What would Flynn call this thing? This is multiple instruction, multiple data. This is the most common kind of you know, processor that you, you, you probably get exposed to. Your phone works this way, your desktop PC, you know. My Intel chip has, you know, 16 cores or whatever. These are your cores or your threads or whatever Intel wants to call them, right? So this means each one of these can be doing a different instruction. That's your multiple instructions. And they all have their own registers. They all can, if they, they could actually be using the same data. That depends on your program. The multiple data means that you have the option of this heart here processing data from a different place in the memory than this heart up here might be using some different thing, completely independent, right? So that's what they mean when they say multiple instructions and multiple data. It doesn't mean it has to be. It means you have the option of doing this, okay? And that's kind of key. Now, uh, as we'll see with our simulator, and we write some programs here, because the simulator is going to initialize each one of these hearts exactly the same as every other one except for one thing. Remember, it's heart ID. Each one of these has a unique ID. It's different from all the other ones. One of them will be zero, like that. One of them will be one, another one will be two, another one will be three, and so on. All right, so there's a lot of different things we could do with this. We could easily write a little program that says if my ID is zero, go off and do one set of, you know, task. Otherwise, if my ID is number one, just do something completely different and so on, all right? Now, that's roughly where we're heading. But how do we get there, all right? Now, if each one of these is autonomous... We need to kind of be careful, right? They're all executing the same program, so to speak, out of the same memory all at once. Or at least that's one way you can use this system, and that's what we're gonna how what we're gonna look at here. We're gonna write what's called a multi-threaded app, and uh, let's look at what the address space kind of looks like when we do this, right? So I'm gonna end up with the usual thing that we've seen a lot. We're gonna have text, we're gonna have data. BSS, right? And we'll have a heap in here. Oops. Grows up this way. And then we'll have a stack coming down. And that's where it gets kind of interesting. If one of these parts is executing some code down here, that's completely different than the code that this heart down here is executing. They need to be very careful that they don't get in each other's way and, you know, try and interact with the heap in ways that uh, could conflict with the other hearts. And what about the stack up here, right? Well, 
whatever this guy is doing here has to be completely independent from what this guy is going to do. So we're going to need a stack for heart zero, and we're going to need another stack for heart uh, number one, and so on. All right? So if you think about it, right, if this heart here is executing a bunch of code and calling subroutines, and what is it doing? It's putting activation record in its stack. Well, if this is doing the same thing at the same time, you can't put all that stuff randomly in one big stack. It just won't work. This one here might decide to return from a subroutine at a different time. That one will. And they don't really know about each other per se. So if this, they both have separate stack pointer registers is the bottom line. Remember, X2 is a stack pointer here. They need to be running independently of each other and not clobbering everything. So what we're going to do is we're going to create two separate stacks. All right. And then what we're going to see is we're going to make each one of them is going to be 4K. And I, and I made them nice and small so that the dumps and how much memory we need is not so big. But in reality, these probably need to be on, in megabytes and stuff if you're going to do anything real, okay? Now, uh, we do have to still concern ourselves with the data and the BSS and the heap down here, okay? Uh, where these are concerned, what we're going to do is we're going to actually write software that collaborates between these two things, all right? Now, the C compiler is going to generate all this code to call subroutines and return and all this other stuff, and um, we are going to really need separate stacks for all that stuff, okay? It's hard for these two guys to collaborate on that sort of thing. On the other hand, what happens to the data and the BSS and the heap is completely up to the code that we write, we're going to take care of what happens down here by just being careful about what our code does on each of these hearts, okay? So what then has to change? And how does this have, you know, get, how, how do these separate stacks come along? Well, remember that our simulator starts with X2 for every one of these hearts is going to point up here at the end of memory, okay? So if I run this with a memory of like eight, triple zero and hacks, right? Oh, 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 all of them will point right here. So what do I need to do? If, if, my, if I'm like heart number zero, I can just use this as my initial stack pointer, all right? So let's write that into our program. What about heart number one? Well, I need it to be eight triple zero. I need to go to 8,000 hacks minus 4K, which is 1,000. So I need this guy's stack pointer to point right down there, 0x7, oh, oh, oh. Let's say I got another heart down here, stack. Well, that one's gonna start at 0x6, oh, oh, oh. Assuming again that each one of these is gonna be 4K, okay? So how do we do this? Well, what we really wanna do is take, you know, register two minus heart ID number times 4K. That would give us these values, right? Well, guess whose CPU doesn't have a multiply instruction? <laughs> okay, <laughs> how do you do this? Well, you do it the dumb way. You do it the way you did it in first grade when you first started learning how to do multiplication. You just add successively. Or in this case, we'll just subtract successively until we've subtracted this, this 1,000 in hacks, this 4K, and that will iterate as many times as the heart ID number is, right? So if I subtract 4K and my heart ID is, is two, I'd go back to the top of my loop and subtract another 4K. That would be two iterations of that loop. And it would have moved it down to this 6,000 hex value and the loop would then end. So what we need to do in our CRT0.S that's different than the one we've been using so far, we have to add one little routine that says, look, subtract 1,000 hacks from the initial X2 value. Remember that's stored in X2. That's where the stack pointer is, according to the API. Oops, I said ABI while I was writing, and then I wrecked my little thing. Anyway, so it needs to subtract the stack size times the heart ID number. No big deal. We can just write that in a loop. No problem. 
Okay. Well, mm, that, that's good for the stack. What about the BSS? How do we zero out the BSS? We got all, you know, could have hundreds of these all going at once. Well, if you think about it, it would actually be no big deal if all these zeroed it out at the same time, right? I mean, after all, you know, who cares if I store a zero in this memory byte once or a hundred times? It would still end up being zero. So we may not care so much about how many times we zero out the BSS, right? On the other hand, it would be nice if we were kind of neat about this. Because if you think about it, if all these hearts were accessing memory, you know, a hundred times more, then the program will run one hundredth as fast as it could due to contention while interacting with this memory. So it would be nice to just keep all these hearts at bay. Look, tell them all to shut up and wait. And heart zero can zero out the BSS. What else do we have to do, right? We have to initialize, um, let's make a list here. One, we gotta set up the stack pointers, right? Two, we have to zero out the BSS, all right? Three, somebody has to initialize the uh, the uh, the uh, C uh, standard library, right? Remember that initialize array function that has to get called? Well, you have to ask yourself, is it okay to call that a hundred times if I have a hundred hearts? Well, the answer is probably no, okay? the th This is what we call um, uh, not thread safe. It is very sloppy. I'll write it again down here. This is not a thread. It's our e a d safe uh, function. All right, this guy here, that initialization routine. Okay, I honestly don't know if it is or not. I always safe to assume if you don't know, then it is not thread safe. And by that we mean if multiple cores multiple hearts execute it is that okay to do or not all right no it's probably not because remember that the definition of this is it's supposed to do the construction of what would otherwise be like c++ objects that are global variables right that have to be constructed before main enters but what if the construction of some object has to do with adding something to something well, it would be off by, you know, however many hearts you have could could uh, add it multiple times and cause all kinds of problems, right? You know, if it's a bank account, the classic example, what happens if you're withdrawing money from a bank account? Well, do you want to withdraw it 100 times or once? I would like to withdraw zero times if I get away with that on my bank account, right? So, you know, it, it, we don't really know what's going to happen in here, so we have to be careful, Right? So we need to do it once for the entire application. Remember, this is one single program. It has one set of text. It has one set of data. It has one BSS. It does have one heap, and we're going to uh, um, create a situation where they can all have their separate stacks, simply because each one of these hearts does need its own stack. No matter how you slice it, we can't get away with that. All right? So we have to be careful about this stuff. Right? So what we're going to do is we're going to make only heart number zero is going to take care of all the things that we have to be careful about. All right, And only when it's done doing that, we're going to let all the other hearts go and they'll all run together. Once everything is set up and ready to go, okay, they'll all start executing. Basically, when that's all done, they're all going to execute main in our new multi-threaded application, okay? So let's look and see how that happens in the CRT0.s. All right, so you should recognize this. These are the example files that I put on Hopper and that are in the zip file on the course website. We've looked at eBreak. We've looked at all these freestanding examples. We have not yet looked at these multi-threaded examples. So let's see how these things are going to work, okay? Bird's eye view, let's just actually look at this one from the backwards, uh, from the top down for a minute before we go from the bottom up. This is the main right here, okay? So the main function is going to return the value of some subroutine called get heart ID, okay? 
Now there's some crud up here that's commented out. We'll look at that a little bit later. Uh, it's commented out, so right now it means nothing whatsoever. It's going to call get heart ID. That's defined in this file right here. And it's written like this. So what is this really going to do? Uh, this is a giant mess that we don't really have to worry about. I'm giving this one to you if you're interested. Uh, we've seen inline assembler before when we were talking about the stub libraries that we have to have in order to make use of the, of the standard library routines, right? It, uh, we saw in here, I, I had some inline assembler that called eBreak in, in, in uh, subroutines and stuff where I wanted to just halt the uh, simulator because they were not well, really functions that were allowed to be run anyway. In this case, we have a more complicated instruction. And what it really boils down to is we've already seen this. We know how it's emulated with our simulator. Um, we need to be able to say execute this instruction. We have a register here, which will be set to the heart ID number. Okay. This instruction says read the heart ID number, store the result in a general purpose register that will appear here. Register zero has to be over here to let the instruction know that it's not going to basically try to change the heart ID number, okay? If you read the specs on what this instruction does, it can read and also modify uh, some of the registers, okay? So by putting register zero here, it says, I just wanna read this, thank you very much, store it in this register right here, okay? If you read up about how the heart ID number a register works, you'll know it's illegal to try to change it anyway. So the only way to read this is in a CR, <laughs> CSRS, uh, instruction with a, a register zero over here and some other register as the target where we're going to receive that hard ID number. Now, if you go and read the documentation of how the GNU compiler works and how an inline assembler works, the short of it is this percent zero over here represents a, a parameter that's described over here. Okay. So it says, look, this percent zero is supposed to be the equals says it's an output operation from this instruction in other words it's going to store a value in that register there the r means it has to be a regular uh, general purpose register it has to be you know x is one through x 31 okay and this over here says as far as the c program is concerned make sure that the register that you put here maps into and represents or somehow gets stored into this variable right here when this instruction is done so that I can use it like a regular C variable after this is all over. In this case, it's just going to simply return it. So what this whole thing means is go get the heart ID and you can actually use heart ID in the assembler. It knows what the names of these registers are. So you don't have to remember that it's F14 in hex, for example. Go get the value of this register, which is the heart ID number, store it in this register. And when the compiler runs, make sure that this register represents where this re variable is being stored. Okay? That's all it really means. And then later on, we just return that value back to main. And main is just going to return it back to uh, uh, CRT0 because that's what calls main. All right? Now... Keep in mind, if we run this on a system with two hearts, main is going to be executed twice at the same time. Each one of the two hearts is going to be calling main at the same time. So when the when heart zero comes along and calls this, and this code up here runs, he's going to get zero into my heart ID and return that back to main here, right? When heart number one is executing main at the same time, and it calls this function, it'll go in here, and it'll get a one and return that back to main. So if we run this program and the CRT zero is right, when the whole thing's done, we go back to CRT zero, and we all know that we do an e-break right after main comes back. We'll be able to know whether this thing worked because, remember... Register X10 is officially the register to use to, to hold return values from subroutines. So main is going to return 
whatever heart ID executed it. If we run this with two hearts right now, which is what the default make run rule does for this program, it compiles it, of course, before it runs it. Here's the here's the command it's going to run. Run the RV32 simulator, RV32i simulator that has the multiple thread support, multi hearts. So it's going to run this program. It's going to fire up two hearts, and it's going to give it eight thousand and hex bytes of memory. Okay. So if we scroll down and we watch this thing run, what we're doing is we're watching the beginning of the CRT0. We'll look at that in a minute and the innards of that whole thing. Remember that the first thing it does is it sets the GP register, and it's going to do this for heart 0, and it's going to do this for heart 1 completely independently. But they're both going to be executing the same instructions at the same time, simply because that's how this thing starts off. And remember, the setting of the GP register is done with the LA pseudo operation, which is an AUI PC followed by an add immediate. So what we're really doing here on core zero, all right, here's core zero. This is core one. So we want to see what zero is doing. We have to look at this, ignore this for a minute, and then we need to come down here and look at this down here. So it did an AUI PC with three, which puts three triple zero into register three, and then it adds this number here to that value, which leaves it with 2818 in hacks, right? And core one is going to be doing the same thing at the same time. Its GP register is going to be set here, OEPC with three, add the same value to it, and it too will be set to this 2818, right? Why? Because they're sharing the same address space, and both of those hearts need to have the same value for the GP registers because they both need to point to the same place. So that actually makes sense. We then see other stuff going on in here, and we see both cores running. Uh, they both execute this CSRRS function. There's the F14, and it says store the result in X10, please. And this is being done on core uh, zero, okay? And we can see over here that X10 on core zero is set to zero. All right, that's nice. <laughs> it seems to work. And down here, we look at the same instruction being executed at the same time on heart or core ID number one. And we see that its X10 register will be set to a one. All right. Now, I showed you this a little bit before we look at the CRT0 to make sure that we all are looking at this in the same perspective. In other words, every instruction that we see in CRT0.S is going to be executed by every core. Okay? It will be at least down to here because this is the point at which each core goes off and does different things. All right? So it doesn't happen for long. And they break apart and they all do their different tasks. All right? So we'll t come back here and look at this a, a, a little bit more later. But that's what we saw the uh, AWI PC and the Add Immediate. That's what's going on in here. Followed by here's the uh, tell me my heart ID number and store it in X10, please. All right? Let's look at the uh, end of this program, since that was the point, right? So we're going to just ignore the execution of most of the program here and go to where it ends, right, where the thing terminates. Remember, at the very end, we have the Z flag set. So we can say, OK, core 0 terminated, and it has executed 286 instructions. Core 1 ended. And it has executed 290 instructions. All right, they don't have to be exactly the same because, again, they ran off and did different things. Um, here are all the registers at the end of core zero, heart zero, running its program. Here are all the registers at the end of heart one running its program. And what do we see? We see X2 here for heart zero set to 8000. And we see X2 for heart number one at seven triple zero. So we see that when we look at the code that goes in there and it figures out, hey, I need a different place for the stack to be for heart one versus heart zero and so on, that code obviously is working because each one of these is bump, gonna be bumped down, right? 
Now, they're all executing the same code at the same time out of the same memory with the shared memory app. And there's all the text, uh, right? And then there's the padding. And then we go down here and we'll see the BSS down here and the, and the heap and stuff like that. I guess we're in the literals and everything else, right? And if you hit uh, Control G, I mean, less, we can go to the end of the file and we can clearly see that, uh, that thread zero down here used its stack. And this is what's left in it, right? It filled it up with something and then it popped it back off most likely. And again, this is probably the X1 uh, value of where it's supposed to go when it's done executing main, right? We've seen that before. If we scroll up, uh, we should see the other stack. So this is 7FFF, right? It starts at 8,000 and moves its way down. So the next one will be at 7,000 as it moves into 6FFF, right? Well, look what happens in here. This is the other stack. It starts right here. It, too, has an 84 in there, but it doesn't have the other junk. Well, why not? Well, like I said, these two hearts, these two cores, you know, differentiated themselves fairly quickly and went off to do different things. The short of it is this heart here, heart number one, waited until heart zero was done with what it was doing, and it went off to call main. And when main ran, it had to call a subroutine, namely the get heart ID subroutine, okay? And when it did that, it had to remember its value in, in X1 so it could get back to CRT0. We've seen this before. When X, uh, rather, that when, when heart number zero runs, it had to do the same thing, but it also had some other stuff to do, right? Remember, it called the initialization routine for the C++ library. So it called a subroutine that Heart1 never called. This is probably junk that the initialization routine left in the stack, okay? So let's look at the CRT0 file now. A little more detail. So what do we got? We have two hearts. Both of them set their global pointer to the exact same thing using the exact same instructions. That's fine. Both of them then does do this, all right? And that's fine too. And uh, one of them will get a zero and the any number of other ones will get values that are not zero. We know that no matter what happens, one of them will be zero. And this is key when you write multi-threaded apps. This is a very important thing. You have the notion of like a root or a parent or a guardian, a keeper process or a keeper thread. And then you have all these other, sometimes they call them worker threads, okay, that do things uh, that are uh, dispatched to them by the, by, the, uh, by the root thread, okay, a task manager or a boss, however you want to call it, right? And the key in this case is that you know one of them is zero. Even if you have only one in a one only core in this system, it will be zero. Okay? The only way not to have a heart or a core with an ID of zero is to have no none at all. Okay? Now, that's important because when you decide how you want to do this, you might think, well, it doesn't matter which core comes along and does all this. And that's a true statement. However... If you want your program to work, no matter how many cores you have, including just one, you better choose zero for, for who gets to do the, 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 the extra work here. Because if you decide, oh, I'm going to wait until core one does this for me, and there isn't a core one, you're going to wait a long time, okay? So look at what happens in the logic in here. I say, what's my uh, heart ID? Very next line of code, I say, look, if the heart ID is not zero, go to this label down here. If the heart ID is zero, I zero out the BSS and call the initialization array. Okay? Let's scroll down a little bit and let's see where this sync all hearts. It's right down here. Okay? It's all on one screen. Nice. Okay. So only heart zero will do this stuff and the init array and this right here, which is real important. Let's look and see exactly what this is doing. This is the essence of this example. This is the essence of uh, what you're going to do if you want to write a producer consumer kind of a program with lock free queues and stuff like that. All right. So let's look really closely at what's happening here. 
we're all cool with this. Only one core is going to do these things, specifically that one there. So we know that we're okay. We don't accidentally do anything twice that we shouldn't be doing. So what happens? Let's look and see what the guys do when they're in sync all hearts. What's going on with this thing? Come back to this in a minute. So a heart zero is clearing out the BSS. The other ones are already down here doing this code. And of course, heart zero is going to fall out of here and run into this eventually on its own as well. Okay. So all hearts eventually end up doing this. So what is this doing here? So I want to load the address of this label into X10, register 10. Then say load the value 0 off of X10 into X11. So really what I'm doing is saying go get the value that's stored in memory here and put it into X11 by these two instructions right here. There may be more efficient ways to do this, but I don't care. Okay? This is done for readability. Get the address, go to that address, get the value, put it in register 11. Then I ask, the value in X11 is not equal to 0. Go back to sync all hearts. So this is a spin loop. And what's it doing? It's waiting for something somewhere to put a 0 in memory at where that label is. That's what this is doing. Okay? Now that we understand that, let's look and see what this is up here. Remember, only heart number zero is doing this up here. Heart number zero is going to say, go give me the address of heart in its sync, which is the same thing. This guy's watching down there. And poke a zero into that location. This is what frees all the hearts up and says, okay, you're all, it's open season. <laughs> you can all do anything you want now. Why? Because... The, uh, core zero is taking care of setting up the BSS and initializing the uh, standard library stuff. All right. At that point, and only that point, all the hearts are free to do whatever it wants and eventually go off and call main. So every one of the hearts in the system, we're all going to call main at the same time, which we already saw happening, right? Okay. So let's go back up. Well, first of all, I guess we can look at the very bottom here. We've seen this before. How do I put stuff in the data section from an assembly language program? Well, you put a dot data right there. You throw a label on it, and then you define a constant. Now, why didn't I put this in the BSS? Well, the BSS will be initialized to all zeros, okay? And it would be initialized to all zeros by the core that's running this code here, which would start probably after all the other hearts would start doing this. And if they're all doing this, they're reading garbage before it's initialized. All right? So we have to be very careful in how we think about the order in which everything is done. That's why this is super important right now, okay? By putting this in the data region and initializing it to 1, okay, it, if we initialize this to 0, in theory it's possible for the compiler to do us a nice favor that we don't want and move it into the BSS, which currently has garbage in it, right? So by putting it in the data and storing a non-zero value in there, the compiler and the assembler, the linker, everybody that's trying to help us by optimizing things has absolutely no option here, no matter what, other than to do exactly what we've told it to do and create a label called heart in its sync on a full word boundary and store a one in there. Okay. Eventually our core zero up here is going to set it to zero right there. Okay. And by making sure it's in the data region, we know that our simulator or, you know, the, uh, the, the, any real processor that's running code out of like an EEPROM or something like that or a flash or whatever, that data will already be initialized before the code really runs, okay? I'm all partly lying to you. There is something special you have to do on systems like that that is uh, sort of resembles how the BSS works, but and you have to do a, a little more than just this super simple thing here, but it basically is the same general concept, all right? So just keep that in mind. If you run off and uh, start writing seriously multi-threaded embedded uh, software tomorrow, okay? Take it slow and pay attention to what you're doing. Okay, so this is where uh, uh, heart zero tells everybody that's spinning around in this loop that it's okay to proceed. 
Part zero now. If I wanted to, I could put a branch statement in here and branch down here. That's fine. But who cares? It doesn't matter. It's set to zero. So even heart zero can go ahead and look in there and reload the value. It just set to zero and ask, is it still zero? Yes, it still is. Therefore, fall down here. Okay. So now heart number zero and everybody else is going to go into this loop here, which is the one that's going to do the simple, foolish, continuously subtract 4K from register X2. And it'll iterate this through, uh, through this loop uh, for as many times as the heart ID number is for that uh, core or the heart. Right, so I'm going to refetch it again. Again, I could optimize this if I would have stored it somewhere else, like in register 30. I could have just, you know, continued to use it uh, from the time I read it up at the top of this file. But again, this is written for readability. Let's just refetch it so we can see it all on the screen at once. And I do a Louis on X11. I store one into X11, uh, rather that one is the parameter here, and therefore. It is uh, the, the, the you know the left twenty bits, so you get the three extra hex digits over here. And by doing this, Louis X eleven comma one, what I've really done is set X eleven to the four K, right? This one thousand in hex value. Okay, so when that's all said and done, I can say, okay, great. Is my core ID my heart ID zero? Well, if it is, I'm done. So heart zero, it's here, realizes he's zero, doesn't do anything, comes down here, and goes on his merry way to call main in the way that we are all familiar with. Well, what if my heart ID is number one? Well, this is not true anymore, therefore the branch isn't taken, right? X10 will have a one in it, one is not equal to zero. Therefore the condition is false, it'll fall down here and it'll subtract X11 from X2. So what is that doing? It's subtracting the 4K from the current stack pointer, and it will then subtract one from the current heart ID number, which is an extent. It'll do an unconditional branch back up to the top of this loop, and it'll say, hey, is my register 10 equal to zero right now? Well, if my heart ID number is one, it would be, and it would say, go down here, finish stack, go on merry way, and call mate. That will leave heart number zero once it gets down to this code right here, the value in X2 on that heart will be 8,000. And when the heart number one gets down here, the value in X2 will be 1,000. And so on, if the, uh, you know, heart number, uh, whatever, three and four and five, each one of them, it'll continuously go down by 1,000 in hex, right? Now, we can't do this infinitely because we don't have enough memory, right? We have to be very careful that if we only have eight triple zero in hex memory, that's 32K total, that we don't put so many cores in here, so many hearts, that we've tried to create too many stacks, right? Let's do a, uh, um, let's have a look at the um, executable, right? Let's recompile everything and say nm minus m, the prog, the, you remember the load module? What happens here? Well, the, the, uh, the BSS ends at this address right here, 289C. So if we allocate too many stacks, the lowest stack that we probably want to risk creating is at 4000, okay? So we're really, in a, we're going to get there in four cores. So given the amount of memory that we have allocated here, we probably don't want to execute this with more than four cores because all of a sudden it'll be trying to store its stack in the middle of the BSS and clobbering all these values. Ultimately, it could go all the way down to the point where uh, a stack could actually clobber the executable code and modify it, and then, you know, all, then it, all hell breaks loose when that sort of thing happens, all right? So if you want to execute this with extra cores, you got to make very uh, make sure that uh, you have enough memory. That's really all there is to it. So I ran it again so we could see the command that it's used to 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 run this thing. If we wanted to run, say, with 16 cores, right, that would require 64k on its own just for stacks, right? And 64k is this much in hex, right? One zero is 16, right? Now we also need to add another 3,000 in hex for all the text, data, BSS. And if we have any heap or anything else going on there, we'd even need more. So let's go ahead and make this 
14, followed by four zeros, to give us a ton of extra memory, okay? If we do this, actually, that's enormous. That's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to move this is what I wanted, okay? So that's 64K plus uh, 4 times 4 plus 6, it was is 16K more than 64k right so this thing here let's round it up to three triple zero and hex throw in another one triple zero and hex for anything that might be using the heap and give it a little bit of space all right plus this uh digit over here gives us an extra the 64k which we all used as stacks if we run this program this way so let's go ahead and pipe that into less because this is going to generate a huge amount of output okay let's look at the terminate statement down here you can see all the cores terminating. Up here, we'll see them all uh, eventually finishing. This is the last core, number 15. Right? So here are they all terminating. They all ran their program. One of them ran 286, 290, 294, 298, 302. Why would all these have completely different numbers of instructions? They're relatively close together. It looks like they're actually differing by about four each. Why do you suppose that is? Well, the reason is because of what happens with the stack loop, all right? Every time you go through that stack loop, remember there were four instructions in there. So that makes perfect sense why every one of these cores is off by four, because they all do the exact same thing otherwise. Uh, what else happens? Well, core zero is gonna just have a completely different size. It's purely coincidental, in my opinion, that this happens to be four less than that, right? Because remember that core zero calls that initialization routine. It does a whole lot of other stuff, okay? So this thing here could be arbitrarily different. But all these other ones here are going to spin around that loop at the same speed at the same time. They're all going to come up and find out that core zero has zeroed out that, uh, um, that flag at the same time and so on. All right, so that doesn't surprise me that they're all off by four. Uh, what else do we got going on here? We should be able to see all the stacks, right? 14, 13, 12. So what we're seeing here is that CRT0, the loop with the stack, working correctly. 10, uh, what's one less than one zero in hex is F. E, D, C, B down here, right? So we look at them all going down A, blah, 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 blah. As we get all the way down here, it goes all the way down to 5, oh, 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 okay? So everything from 0 up to 3, F, F, F is stuff that's not reserved for stacks. Because remember, this thing starts at 5, triple zero, but it has 4K reserve for it. This is the high memory, right? So this goes from 5, zero, zero, zero down to uh, five uh, to 4, uh, zero, 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 okay? Which is why what's left over goes from 0 to 3, FFF, right? And that's what's going on down here. We looked at this before, and uh, according to the NM, this should end around 2, 8, something or other. Okay, so yeah, that ends about right here. And uh, most likely somebody has some stuff in the BSS, which is why these are zeroed out. We looked at this before. The malloc routine had a bunch of variables that were in the BSS. So that's probably what this is used for right here. Because nobody actually called malloc, it didn't really do anything. Okay? Uh, if it did, we would have been seeing, uh, you know, regions of memory allocated out of here. And if we wander up, this is the part of, uh, what do we got uh, the first stack, right, that ends at 4,000. Uh, oh, no, it, the first stack ends at 5,000 in hex, right? Or it starts there. Oh, and we see, look in here. There's the first stack. The, the initial stack pointer is here. And, and because we have a full descending stack, the first time we call push and it starts at 5,000, the first thing it's going to do is, is, is reduce the stack pointer by the size of the thing that we needs to be pushed, and then that value is stored in there. So all these cores, just like we saw before, we'll see an 84 with a bunch of zeros after it. There was one that just went by right here. These are the addresses of the X1 register, and, and thread zero again will have its down here, followed by the extra stuff in the stack that it probably acquired while calling the initialization function, all right? So what's the takeaway from here? This thing here will initialize each one of the hearts with its own stack. And we've got some special logic in here with a, with a lock 
or a, we could call it a, you know, a semaphore or a flag or whatever you want to call it, that allows one core and one core only to do all this critical stuff. This is called like a critical region. Only one core, only one heart should do this work, okay? All the hearts are free to do all this other stuff down here, right? Calculate the value of its own stack, call the main routine, and do anything else it wants. But that should only happen once everything is initialized, okay? So that's the purpose of this MT00 example program. Now let's look and see what's going on Oops, with that thing that I commented out in main, right? So just ignore that because I have an if zero around it. Well, let's turn this back on and call this the exact same code and the get hard ID from that other file, right? But I put an X in front of it so that it's different. We don't have a multiple defined thing. We don't have to hack up the make file and all that other stuff. Let's call this one instead. What's the difference? I just told you, exact same code. You'd think we would get the same results here, okay? So this is a little bit of a side uh, side note. What's going to happen here? Let's look at what comes out of this program listing over here. You find our main in here. There's that X routine, get hard ID, okay? Look what happened to main. Uh, Main has one inst. It looks like somehow Main stole the source code from this function and did it on its own and then just returned with the jailer. All right, now that's in stark contrast to what will happen if we put this back the way it was. Turn that off. Put this back like this. We don't actually have to turn off this thing up here if we don't want to, uh, but it will get it out of the program listing if I shut it off, right? So let's recompile everything. Let's relook at the uh, the main now. Look at the difference. What in the world just happened? As it's written right now, main really does call get heart ID. And it really does back the stack pointer down by 16 bytes and store X1, do the OWI PC and the jailer like we saw before to call a subroutine. When it comes back, it's, I don't know what it's doing. Oh, it's getting the X1 variable now out of the stack that it's saved. It's putting the stack pointer back up to where it started and going back to the caller. So what's going on here? This is the compiler helping us. This is what I keep talking about. You got to be careful when you do things. Sometimes someone helps you and it can confuse you massively. And it did me. This was the original way I implemented this. What is it doing here? Uh, the compiler, when both of these are in the same file, it knows what this function's really doing. It understands side effects and all kinds of stuff. And it's smart enough to know, hey, I can inline this entire subroutine in main if I feel like it. It still has to keep this in the file in case some other program or subroutine that the compiler does not currently know about wants to call it. Okay, so it has to keep it there. That's why it still exists. But the compiler just decided that rather than doing all the code you just saw, it's logically identical in this case to just inline that entire function. And once you've done that, there's no reason to call a subroutine, so there's no reason to save X1. There's tons of instructions that go away. So the whole thing turned into one line of code followed by go back to where I came from. So... Conclusion, the compiler is smarter than you think and sometimes dumber than you think at the same time. All right, so I just wanted to make sure that we all saw that because it can get confusing if you write a bunch of code and all of a sudden whole subroutines go away. All right, um, uh, by, four, uh, by the way, uh, MT00 is what we were looking at. By putting this in a separate file, Okay, what we've done here is we've forced the compiler, 
Now, as it's written right now in my hacking code, this is all still calling it directly. But if I call get heart ID in here from main when the compiler is compiling main, it doesn't know what the source code is. It's in a different file when I just called get heart ID without the X right there. Okay. It doesn't reach over here and sneak a peek. All right. It says, well, You've cornered me. I really do have to call get hard ID, and that's why I put all that code in there. All right. That's what I wanted you to see in here. Okay. So let's see. MT01. What is this one doing? Okay. This is our final example. Uh, if we diff the CRT0.s, we'll see they're exactly the same. So we don't need to look at this and review that anymore. So let's go ahead and diff that. This one versus the one in the MT00 directory are identical. We can also diff this thing. I know these are exactly identical as well. Okay. Oops, I didn't put the directory on the other one. MT00. Those are the same. We never looked at this, but the only thing inside here is the declaration of this function. <laughs> and the only thing in here is the declaration of the function that is implemented in here. Okay. We've already seen that. Let's look at the new main.c. Uh-oh, lots of code. Oh, no. Reality setting, and we have to solve a real problem. So this program is designed to be run with two hearts, okay? And those two hearts start main running. And if I say, if my heart ID is zero, I'm going to call this producer subroutine. Otherwise, I'm the other one, and I'm going to call the consumer subroutine. We scroll up here, we got two subroutines. One of them's called consumer, one of them's called producer. Okay, we got some variables up here. Let's look and see what these things do. This is a simple producer consumer example where the producer and the consumer are running in separate threads at the same time on the same system with shared memory, okay? So let's look and see what's going on here. Now, this is a C program. Otherwise, I would have used, like, const expert for these things, right? Well, it's hard enough to get a C program running. If you want to start a C++ program running, I can show you how to do it, but we need a whole other library, and when you need another one of those set of stub routines for all the fancy C++ stuff in addition to the C stuff, okay? So I thought I would uh, keep it simple, and we have to, you know, do some uh, old-school stuff here and use pound defines rather than constant expressions, which is what you should use if you can. Uh, on a modern compiler that's uh, less than uh, six, seven years old, okay? All right, so what do we got here? We got a constant called buffer size, and we have this buffer down here whose size is buffer size, okay? Uh, number of bytes to send is going to be buffer size times three plus two, and the consumer buffer size is going to be set to buffer size times four. Okay, so what does all that mean, okay? What we're going to do is we're going to use this buffer in a lock free as a lock free queue, okay? We have this producer position and we have the consumer position variable, okay? Now these are simple enough that I think you can stare your way into understanding them, but let's go ahead and draw a nice little diagram to see how these buffers work, right? So here's this thing called buffer, which I suppose I probably should have called it the producer buffer. And there's two position variables in here that are both starting at zero. Now remember that all these, these variables are going to be initialized before main gets called. Okay. Turns out these are initialized to zero and they'll be in the BSS, but that's okay because the heart number zero, remember, clears out the BSS before any of the it or any of the other hearts pr proceed on to start running main. Okay. Uh, and this buffer here would actually, actually also be part of the BSS and initializes zero as well. But that's not important to us right now. Uh, the initial value of this buffer is not really that important. Notice these things say volatile in here. And so did those inline assembler instructions. If you don't know what volatile means, look at what the difference is between this line here and this one there. So what does this mean? What it means when you say something is volatile is you're telling the compiler, don't help me. Don't optimize it. Don't change it. Don't move it. Don't do anything at all. Do exactly what I say when I say it. 
in what I would argue in the most intuitive manner, which is this. See what is uh, buffer is volatile, p pos is volatile, and c pos is volatile. What that means is any time there's a line of code in here that refers to buffer or p pos or c pos, okay, it's absolutely mandatory that the compiler generates code that says you must go into memory and fetch the current value of ppos right here in the middle of this instruction and down here when it compares it to cpos it has to fetch the value of cpos and do this comparison every time in other words don't go in here and read ppos store it into a register and try and optimize this code because it doesn't technically need to be stored back in memory while this code is running, okay? But we're going to find out both of these routines in different threads are using these variables at the same time. So if this routine was optimized so that it says, oh, I'm going to just read CPOS and PPOS into register, you know, temporary registers 1 and 2 and keep them there while I do all this code, is a favor to the programmer so that this code runs faster and does less interactivity with memory and all that fun stuff. <laughs> That's all fine and dandy for this subroutine. But if this one up here never sees CPOS changing its value, this whole thing will stall. All right? That's the whole point. Whenever you say something's volatile, all right, take another step back that says, look, you're not the only person in the universe, okay? This function here, anyone who uses this, needs to understand that some thread or something else in the system that's unknown to the compiler when it's building this code could sneak in here and change these values of these items at any time without any notice to the compiler or the code that's running in here. Okay, that's really what it means. And that's exactly what's going to happen when we look at these two functions, all right? There's, this guy's going to be modifying things that's being looked at uh, down here, all right? And this is how these guys are going to communicate, all right? So let's look and see what's going on with this, with this buffer up here. Like I said, I probably should have called it the producer buffer. Um, but this is the buffer that's shared between the producer and the consumer uh, uh, functions here, along with PPOS and CPOS. All right, so what we got here is called a producer, consumer, problem. Okay, now what the heck does that mean, right? Well, that means that what we're going to do is we've got a piece of code that's that's producing something, right? So it's gonna, you know, it's gonna say here's here's a here's some data, All right? And it's gonna go into a buffer. And then you've got this consumer over here that wants to read stuff out of this buffer. Okay, and it's going to say, thanks. I got the data. All right, now normally when you do this sort of thing, the producer can run uh, in, for an infinite amount of time, or, you know, in theory, it can continuously put stuff in the buffer forever. The consumer has to keep taking stuff out of the buffer forever. The buffer is limited in size, so if the producer runs faster than the consumer, it'll fill up the buffer, and the producer is going to have to wait for the consumer to come along and clear some room out of this buffer so that the producer can continuously fill it in. This buffer, we will see, is what's called a ring buffer, actually. or a circular queue, and it may have some other names. There's a lot of different ways to think about this, right? So this buffer is a circular buffer, circular queue, ring buffer, whatever you want to think of it. What's going to happen is, I'm going to just put some numbers in here. If the producer is going to produce items, and let's say it's counting, one, two, three, and four, and dot, dot, dot. It's going to fill these things in in this order, okay? When it gets to the end over here, maybe, uh, I don't remember. Actually, I think our, our buffer had eight items. It had enough room for eight uh, uh, elements in it, right? 
when that happens, it, it, it becomes full, right? So what do, we, what do we know? Let's talk about the states of this buffer. The buffer can be empty, right? Nothing's in it at all. It can be full or it can be partially full, right? These are the three different situations we can be in. So we need to be able to know how to recognize and represent those. We need to make sure our program will work and, and, and not get stuck and confused when, it's, when this is happening, right? So how are we going to do this, all right? So let's get a new page here. <clears throat> okay. Here's our buffer. We know that it has eight bytes in it, okay? And in the example code that I wrote, the producer is going to produce, uh, what do we got, buffer times three plus two bytes. That would be uh, three times eight is 24. So that means I'm going to produce 26 bytes. Okay, certainly more than can fit in this buffer, okay? And the consumer has to consume these 26 bytes. All right, so you saw that CPOS and PPOS thing going on down there. What's that all about? Well, and they both start at zero, right? So that if we think of this as an array, there's the zero element, the one, the two, the three, the four, the five, and the six, and I guess seven and eight. So there's the eight bytes in this uh, buffer, right? So we got PPOS is pointing to zero and C pause. This stands for producer position and consumer position. Now there's a lot of ways to skin this cat. There's always another way to write an app. This is just one way to solve this problem, okay? So let's see what's gonna happen here. This situation when C pause equals P pause, that's when it's empty. Remember that was condition A, empty equals C pause is equal to p pause. I suppose it make this a colon or something, right? When these two are the same, the buffer is empty. And that's literally true. They could both be pointing here. It doesn't matter that they're both pointing at zero. It's just coincidental. We got to start them somewhere. Okay. All right. So what happens when I produce something? Let's say I produce something and I produce a one and I put it in there. What do I do? I take p pause and I move it over to here, right? Okay, I produce another thing, I put a two in here, and I advance p pause over to here. All right, what does the relationship between these things represent? Well, it's a look, if I ever have c pause is not equal to p pause, then I know there's data in this buffer that can be consumed. If these two are not equal, there's data in here. Where, how much data? Well, there's one data element in each space here between CPOS and PPOS. So if I've produced three items over here, PPOS would have been moving over like this, okay? So CPOS is the oldest element in the buffer at this point, and the first one that should be consumed. When it's consumed, CPOS needs to move over here. They're still not the same in this example, so it can consume again and move it over to here. And that point, C pause would be pointing here, and P pause would be pointing over there. There's still data consumed. Why? Because they're not equal. So at that time, it'll consume this and advance C pause over to here. They'll both be pointing here. It'll then become empty again, right? So it's not empty whenever these two are not the same, all right? Now, what happens when we run off the end over here? Well, we just wrap back to the beginning. By making this buffer a power of two in its size, the assembler will use simple uh, and masking and wrapping to go around and around in here. Uh, you should have had an assembly language course before this, and you should have seen uh, uh, what happens when you have a circular queue and a power of two, and you use an and mask to wrap the thing around. It makes the, uh, the math more convenient for the CPU. What you're really doing is simple modulus division. Okay, so in our code, what we're going to do is every time we add one to PPOS, we're going to set it like this. We're going to say PPOS 
equals p pos plus one modulo the buffer size, which is going to be eight, like this. So what does that really do? It says, you know, when it's when it, when the p pos is zero plus one, it's one plus one is two, and so on. When it gets up to here, remember this is seven. 0 through 7, okay, because these are array indices. When we say 7 plus 1 modulo 8, we get 0. So once we're done with this one, we move back to the beginning over here, okay? So every time we advance pos or pos, we're going to do it like this, okay? That way they're going to chug her up and around and around and around and around and around, all right? So that way, what happens is when we have a situation where, let's say, C pos is over here, and P pos is over here, what does that mean? Well, it means that these elements here, you know, 1, 2, 3, and 4, have new data items in it. And every time it's consumed, it's going to go over here, then it's going to go over there, there, and then it'll go over here. When they're equal, it's empty, right? So what do we know? When, when is it full then? Well, it turns out if P pos ever points right here, then we can't store any more items in this buffer. And what do we really know? If the buffer size is 8 and we use this particular algorithm, this cannot be used. I can't store anything in there. Because if I did, then p pos would move over here, they'd be equal, and it would be considered empty rather than full. So this has one downside, and using it this specific manner is the most number of elements in this buffer is equal to the buffer size minus one. Okay? This is a great quiz question. Expect to see it on an exam or something someday. Well, I'll ask what's the max number of elements in, let's call this the MT01 example program equals what? Buffer size minus one. That's your answer. Why? Because you can't use this one. You can never have an element in the buffer at the address that or index that pos is currently pointing to. Because pos always points at the first empty one, the next one that could be filled. Okay? And when you get to the end of this thing and you're filling it all the way up, it can't put anything there because it would have to move over here like I just explained. All right? So this is a, uh, a great, uh, simple, stupid, silly question that clearly states, oh, yes, I know what you're talking about, or no. All right? So also could be some sort of a job interview question now that I think about it. They could explain this whole thing out in a complicated question and then ask this. All right? Again, it's a trivial thing if you know the meaning of these darn pointers. And this is a common uh, situation that happens with uh, circular uh, cues that are managed in this particular way. There's other ways to manage them, and you can put extra flags and make use of this extra item, but it's really simple to be a little bit wasteful here and do it like this, all right? So in the interest of keeping the code simple, uh, let's do it like this, all right? So what do we then know about full and partially full? I think this is intuitively obvious. When p pos is, you know, you can't say c pos minus 1, right? Because what happens when p pos is way over here and c pos is way over there? Well, you still have a situation where the buffer's full, and c pos is really not equal to p pos plus 1 at that point, because p pos plus 1 would be 8, and c pos is really 0. What you could say is when p pos plus 1 modulo 8 equals c pos, then you know it's full. Another wonderful little stupid uh, quiz question, okay? Uh, and of course, this is full. Of, uh, this situation is full of things like that. Okay, so uh, expect to hear this come up again. Is what I'm saying. So, what does it then mean to send 26 bytes by uh, way of a buffer that only can hold eight? Well, what that means is that the producer and the consumer might bump into each other by filling up this buffer any every now and then and forcing the producer to wait 
uh, for on the consumer if the consumer is slower than the producer. It turns out if the consumer is faster than the producer, then the buffer will almost always be empty because every time the producer puts something in here, if it's the slower one in this example, the consumer would just be there right away and consumer and, 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 and catch right back up again. Okay, So what we should see if we write this program and, and, and run it is that the producer and the consumer pointers will be chasing each other around this buffer three times before it ends. Okay. And what we'll look at is the consumer buffer in this example program, remember, is, is, is the buffer size times four. So this is actually going to be, this is the, what are we going to call this one, the consumer buffer. I made this 32 bytes, okay? So what did I do? I'm going to produce 26 bytes. I'm going to put it through this chokehold, a small buffer that only holds eight at a time, and the consumer will be able to get the entire message, all 26 bytes, and store it in its buffer with a little bit of bytes to spare. So that's what we're going to see this program do. Okay, so what do we got going on here? I'm going to set data to 20. What's this data going to be used for? Well, this is going to be a counter. In this example, what I'm going to do is the message I'm going to send, this is the producer, he's going to set this hex 20, and that's what's going to go into this buffer. See what's going on here? And I, I'm going to write it in there, and then I'm going to add one to data. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fill up this buffer, essentially in this loop, with a 20 in hex, then I'm going to, sort, and then I'm going to put a 21 in there, and then a 22, and so on, until I'm done sending num bytes to send, which I, let's scroll up here, that should be up here somewhere, right? It's going to be one of these pound defines, number of bytes to send, that's buffer size times 3 plus 2, which is going to be 26 in decimal, all right? So this is going to go from 20 to whatever that comes out to in hex, right? Uh, so what else is going to happen? Well, we have to know, we have so many bytes to send, we're going to count them using this variable here, and what we're going to do, we're going to say, well, I got more stuff to do. I'm going to send it. Every time I send it, I'm going to add one to I. So that's how this while loop eventually ends, right? Uh, when it's executing, what do I do? I say, if next pause, remember when I said, you know, is a P pause plus one modulo eight. Okay. That would be what P pause should be. If I'm able to produce something and then, uh, you know, store it in there and advance the uh, the PPOS variable, right? So I'm going to then ask, well, is that not equal to CPOS? What am I asking? That's the, is the buffer full right now, okay? When PPOS plus one modulo this equals CPOS, then we know it's full. If it's not equal, then we say it's not full, and I can put more data in there. So that's exactly what's going on here. And then I can say buffer sub p pause equals the data, and then I can add one. Remember, the data plus plus is going to add one after it stores it in there. So the first time through, it'll put 20 in there, a hex 20, and then it'll add one to data, leaving it set to 21. I set p pause equal to next p pause, which is basically p pause equals p pause plus one modulo eight, right? And that's what I stored in there. And I am going to add one to the i because I sent one of my 26 bytes. Okay, and then I'm going to come out of here and I'm going to go back around to the top of the while loop. Let's say eventually we outrun the consumer. So what's going to happen? Well, it's going to calculate this value. And by definition, it's full when, when this is equal to CPOS. So it can't do this. So it's going to immediately just come back around to the while loop. We haven't advanced this, therefore, this would still be true. And it's going to do this exact thing again, and it's going to ask again. This is why it's absolutely critical that these things be marked as volatile, okay? Because if the compiler decides to compile this code by reading the value of CPOS and keeping it in a register the entire time while this loop runs, as an optimization, which the compiler will do. I guarantee it if you don't mark these as volatile. 
CPAS will never change, even if this down here, which is running in a different thread at the exact same time, changes CPAS, okay? This guy up here would never know because the compiler will have optimized away the, the rereading of this variable out of the memory as it goes around this loop, okay? I can't stress enough that if you have more than one thread, any variable that needs to be shared between those two threads, okay? Probably, I mean, 99 times out of 100, probably needs to be set to volatile, okay? Now, if you don't want to be beating this thing to death repeatedly over and over and over and over again, like if I repeated this code here, down here, it would have to read PPAS again because it's volatile, all right? The compiler is really anal retentive about that. It'll do it every single time you see it. Sometimes when I write code in a situation like this, I will go ahead and store, like I did here, a next CPAS. I might even say int current CPAS equals just CPAS or PPAS. And so that I can use my local, uh, you know, a copy of that variable, knowing the compiler is not going to go back and refetch it over and over again. All right. But that's a little bit more advanced stuff. For absolute certainty, sledgehammer solution, declare all the variables that are shared across your threads as volatile, and they will work in an intuitive fashion, okay? You can then optimize as you go, all right? I didn't do this to optimize it really for speed per se. I did this because I need to use it here, and I need to use it again there, and I didn't want this giant wad here as well as there, okay? But as a side note... FYI, I'm I'm allowing the compiler to do this by reading PPAS once for all, for both of these and not forcing it to read it twice. Okay, it's going to read it again for this anyway, but uh, that's a whole other story. Okay, all right. So that's how this producer works. If the consumer is running slow, notice what's happening here. This never stops. This heart will be spinning around and around and around and around and around and around here. It never stops. What could it ever do? What am I doing? There's no operating system around here to pause this thing. There's no yield. There's no suspend. It's not blocking, all right? If you wrote this in with P threads or like Java or something like that, that has, uh, you know, built in, you know, uh, synchronized functions and stuff like that, what would happen is the operating system would actually stop this thread from executing if you write it correctly all right this is a spin loop okay uh if you wrote it with a semaphore like a mutual exclusion lock on this or something like that the operating system could pause this thread the whole heart could be taken uh, could, could stop executing this code and it could be used to execute some other code all right that's why your, your your pc can execute more programs than you have cores all right if every program was written like this with a spin loop it wouldn't work so well okay your your system would really be heating up and bogging down if every single one of its cores were spinning all the time and that will happen now, there's some scientific programs that are written that, that do use this technique. Uh, a lot of systems do certain things that are not uh, slow in long-running processes. If, they, if it's known that it'll be a brief wait, there's no reason to yield your entire CPU and flush the cache and change the virtual address space and run a whole other program. If you know you're going to come back, whatever you're waiting for is going to become ready in, in a matter of a couple of loop times in here, all right? Because it's a lot more work to just stop and run some other program for a while while you're busy over here, okay? So this is going to spin, right? If you run this and you look closely at all the uh, executions, that's what's going to happen. Now, at the same time that that's happening, here's our consumer buffer. The consumer is going to read one byte at a time out of the shared buffer here. I like, like I said, maybe I should rename that to the producer buffer at some point. But I'll leave it this way because that's what's in the example. Some of you may have already downloaded it. 
The consumer buffer is going to fill up with all the bytes, and I made it big enough to hold the whole message, right? So what is this guy going to do? He's going to go from I equals zero, same while loop. Well, you know, for however many bytes I know I'm supposed to get, pardon the misspelled consume that I just noticed in my doc. Sorry about that. Uh, what is this guy going to do? Same thing. He's got a spin loop. There's no way for this to stop. What is he doing here? If C pause is not equal to P pause, then we know there's something in the buffer. Copy it out. Add one to P pause and modulo eight so that it wraps around the buffer. Count the item that's been consumed and go on your merry way. Okay? Look at all the times I mess around with C pause in here. There's going to be a lot of load words in here to do all this, plus the load byte from the buffer here, right? Because the buffer is really being filled with characters, right? So that's a character buffer in there, okay? So this basically is sending a message of bytes from the producer to the consumer. That's what this thing's doing, all right? That's it. So let's go ahead and see what happens when this thing runs. Uh, what are we looking at here? We're looking at an awful lot of code. I forgot to say uh, sort it numerically. There we go. It goes up to 29AC. Look, there's our consumer buffer and our buffer. How handy. They're sitting right there. And we're right in the middle of the BSS. There's our C pos and our P pos as well. So 2944, 2948, 2980, and 2988 are our buffers in here, okay? All the rest of this stuff is, you know, all the standard library junk and all the other uh, routines that it uses, none of which we're really going to call because we're not mallocking or anything else. But this is all boilerplate stuff that it has to have around in, 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 in the minimal default case. And here's our code right here, which uses almost nothing. So it is truly amazing how much you you end up consuming when you uh, use a, a you know a simple other library. We go from 188 in hex all the way up to uh, like 2944 uh, before we get back to uh, you know consuming space for our stuff. All right, so this is a little bit wasteful because again I know we're not going to be calling any of this stuff. All right, but that's just part of what you get for making your life easier by having libraries available to you. If you really wanted to optimize it, we could probably remove uh, the standard library because I happen to know none of these functions are getting called because we aren't doing anything that would cause mem copy and string copy or anything like that to take place. But those are optimizations I'll leave to you to decide if and how and when you'd like to do that sort of thing to try and save uh, you know, 8K of RAM. In these days, on uh, machines that have gigabytes, you probably don't care. On a small embedded system, like, you know, if you're going to write this on an Arduino, you've already exceeded all the RAM in the entire machine just by having 8K in use, right? So it really depends on your, your you know, the, your perspective in the scale of the problem you're trying to solve here. All right, so if we look at our make file, uh, what's this thing going to do if it runs? I'm going to give it 32K. I'm going to give it an IRZ, so we're not going to disassemble. There's a lot of junk in there. We're not going to dis uh, disassemble it in the front. We're going to look at the instructions, the registers while it's running, and we're going to look at the post uh, uh, execution dump. We have two cores, and we're going to execute uh, the program.bin. Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and say make run, pipe it into less. So what are we really uh, doing here? We need to uh, keep track of this. Maybe I'll open up an extra window and paste the, the data in there. So let's go ahead and keep this like a little scratch pad over here. Let's open up an editor and store these items in. Oh, I lost my window. Those two guys and our buffer and our consumer buffer. And our consumer buffer. So we can remember these addresses. That's why I did that. Okay. So let's go ahead and run it. <laughs> okay. So I ran this command and piped the output into less. We've already seen the CRT0 fire itself up and then get to the point where it starts running main. I'm going to just go down here to the terminate routines and see what happens. So the producer and the consumer threads, they run a, a, you know, a different amount of instructions. That's not shocking. They're doing a very different tasks. Uh, I'm surprised they're even as close as they are. 
when the whole thing's done, you'll notice that that uh, Core Zero has used its stack and finished using it, and obviously it got back up to 8,000. This one went down and got used for whatever it's going to be used for and ended up back at 7,000. That's not too bad, right? So what do we uh, expect to see here at the end of this program? Well, the CPOS and the PPOS variables, uh, one would argue they're random, but we know that because we sent 26 bytes and they both started at zero, they should be two bytes into this buffer right here at the very end. So let's go down in memory and look at this area, which we know the line begins with it. that. And this simply says, show me that. Show me the line that starts with. Show me the line that starts with 00002940, oh, which is right here. And this I can recognize is what we want in ASCII, all right? So let's look again. What are we looking at? The C pause and the P pause. So at 2944 and 2948 are these variables. And there's 2944, and that's set to 2. That's exactly what we'd expect, right? And here's the uh, the, the P pause, right? I can't remember what order. What is it? C pause is at 44, and P pause is at 48. <laughs> When we're done, we know we're done, and we know it makes perfect sense that they're both the same value. That would have to mean that the buffer is currently empty. And if the consumer consumed everything that the producer was supposed to produce, these better be equal, no matter what their values are, right? Okay, that's great. Well, what's in the buffer? Well, the buffer would have the last eight bytes that were transmitted. And the last byte transmitted would be where? Not at 2, because that's where pause currently is, and that represents an empty element. It would be one byte into the buffer at buffer index 1, okay? So the 0th index would be at 2980. The index number 1 would be at 2981. So it ended here at 39. In fact, this is the entire buffer. And remember, we started with hex 20. And then we went on to 21, 22, 23, 24, and so on. So what do we see in here? 32, 33, 34, 5, 36, 37, 38, and 39. That is exactly what we would expect to see if indeed 39 in hex is supposed to be the last possible value. Um, I don't know if I can do that in my head. I want to ask if uh, we started at hex 20 and we want to send decimal 26 is that figure well decimal uh, 16 is 10 and uh, that would be uh, 10 plus a in hacks and it started at zero so that's exactly the last value that we would expect to see in there okay that comes out just right so what's over here what starts at 2988 well that's the consumer buffer and that makes perfect sense it consumed the 20, 21, 22, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, A, B, C, D, E, F, blah, 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 37, 38, and 39. And there's some extra bytes to spare in here, right? Perfect. That's absolutely amazing. Okay. The code worked. What's over here? I don't know, to be honest with you. Some extra junk is in here. Why do we see all this 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9? Well, by me choosing 20 hex 20 to start and going on from there. Well, it turns out that hex 20 is the first printable character in the ASCII character set. If I started it at zero, there would be all control codes and we see all these dots kind of the situation. Well, a hex 20 is a space. That's this thing right here. X21 is an exclamation point or a bang. And then we have the quote and so on, blah, 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 blah. And special characters and stuff like that. The zero here is a hex three zero, which is this right there. And that's why we see zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven perfectly aligned right here. And, and then eight and nine are the 38 and 39. All right. So I did that on purpose so it's easy to find when I was debugging my, uh, my code. All right. So that's all cool. This thing works, looks great. Uh, what else can we look at in here? Well, we go to the very end by hitting capital G and less. And once again, we see that the uh, heart number zero really didn't use a lot of stack space in here. Just saved a couple of registers and the X1 value to get back to where it's got to go. 
What about the other stack? Oops, that one came along, and it didn't really do much either. Also, it only saved the return address so that main could call one lousy subroutine. This all makes perfect sense. If we look at main again, what does it really do? Oops. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Main.c. He has to call get hard ID. When he calls get hard ID, he had to store his, his X1 register so he can remember how to get back when he's done. Then he calls producer. Again, he has to make sure he's already stored his X1 register. If we look at main, that we will see it store it, and then it will see it call this guy and call that guy and then just return. Okay? Or it will say call this guy and then it'll call the consumer, depending on which one of the threads, which one of the hearts is executing. Okay? Look, let's look at these guys. Is there any reason that these guys need to store anything in a stack? They make no subroutine calls. They use no standard library routines. There's no sneaking of, you know, oh, I did a weird uh, mathematical operation in here that the CPU can't do, like a floating point or a multiply or something like that. This modulo operator, if we go look at this, uh, the assembler code in here, is going to be done with a simple AND instruction. It'll be optimized away. It, it doesn't need anything for that either. Okay? This is written so that we know that the code will execute perfectly on an RV32i without anything weird going on, all right? So let's have a look-see at the listing real quick to make sure that my guesses, because I haven't even checked, big risk, foolishness, calling the audible right in the middle of a lecture, right? What's going on in here? Make some room in the stack. Store X1 so I can reuse it. OEPC X1 with this and call get hard ID. It comes back. The return value will be an X10. And then it says branch if X10 is not zero over to two uh, main plus two C, which is at one seven C. This is it asking, am I heart number zero or not? And if it's not zero, go to one seven C. That's this guy down here. That's the else in our uh, code. So what does the else part of the uh, program do? It calls the consumer. What does it do when it's done? Well, it actually, what this does is it call. Uh, it doesn't call. It just does a, a, a jump to 16C, which is up here where it finishes and leaves the, um, the main routine. So that's kind of interesting. It put the else way down here, and when it was done, it branched up into the middle here to do the um, exiting of the main, right? Um, it's 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 putting zero into the return value because if you recall main returns a zero it then gets the x1 register back out of the stack it adjusts the stack up back to where it belongs removing you know it's its activation record here and goes back to crt zero in the case when this condition is false and x10 is equal to zero it doesn't how we pc and jailers off to the producer and when the producer returns, it just falls into the exit code. So that's exactly what the main does. Here's the uh, consumer, if I'm not mistaken. And what's going on in here? We see no jailers going to subroutines at all. We see a branch here that goes back up to one C for whatever that means. Up, up, uh, whoa, 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 what's he doing here? What does that do? Oh, that goes to 104. I'm sorry. It's consumer plus hex 1c which is 104 so this guy just branches back up to here okay oh this is probably the end of the while loop one would expect to see a loop in here right so what is he really doing he's probably saying uh you know am i finished with my 26 bytes so maybe we'll see 26 being stored into a register somewhere that's interesting right so um uh, what he's doing, I guess, is he's trying to use the address of the consumer buffer to figure out when he gets to 26. So he's probably going to just say, is the pointer equal to the 26th, uh, you know, address in the buffer in, in his condition here? And that's probably what he's doing, is he's saying it's 13 equal to 11. So 11 is probably the ending address. 13 is the beginning address or like the, the current address. So we'd see X13 
down here should probably have a like add one to x13 somewhere in here while the application runs which is right there so this is it adding one as it consumes bytes as it goes around in the uh as, as they're stored in the consumer buffer the producer up here will look very similar because the logic is almost the same somewhere in here it'll have a 26 and write 26 things it'll count and here's again here's the adding of something that's counting uh remember this one starts at a hex 20 and counts up from there so somewhere in here we should see somebody getting set to a, a hex 20 which turns out to be in decimal of 32 so i'll bet anything this is the initialize the uh the data counter to, to hex 20 and uh, we should see it adding one so that's the one that gets added one and so on again with the compiler running and optimizing this code might be difficult to un unravel i'll leave that rest of that as a task for the viewer but the bottom line is because the consumer never calls any subroutines the producer never calls any subroutines you can see that um this never as long as it never uses any of the uh any of the registers that have to be saved, like X1, then it doesn't really even use its stack at all. You don't see X2 even touched in here. This entire subroutine, it's called a leaf subroutine, right? It means there's no, it has no uh, other children uh, subroutines. Like when you're looking at a binary tree or something, or any tree and a data structure, the leaves are the nodes at the end of the tree that have no children. So this is what we call a leaf um, a function, right? It's a tail uh, in, 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 the, uh, in the call tree, all right? So those are everything you need to know about getting heart started in the simplest application on an RV32i. Thanks for watching. See you on the internet.